left it off at the one hour mark is talking about the impact of TDS and TMT crews, these two important crews that painted trains and did some of the best trains in the history of this movement and how you as a young painter, you and your friends had to compete. Yeah, big time. On, on the train lines and, and you were mentioning how you uh, were having war with some of these people, but you respected their work enough not to touch it on the outsides of the trains. Why did you respect these artists so much that you would do that? Like, uh, can you can you break that down? You can't, like with, with TMT crew, they were the most elite group of writers and, and we, we just loved their whole cars. They did big productions. Uh, we understood the kind of, uh, labor and risk that was involved with that, right? Because we were following suit. And I think as writers that wanted to come up in kind of in, in at that level with them, um, it's not a good look to like, you know, cross out some of the kings, you know, some of the style masters, especially um, at that level, you know, and that, you, you know, that's why the, the insides, you know, that was a kind of a personal beef that kind of just crossed over it, it, and and went out of control but there was always an, and still to this day there's a great admiration um i have for them i mean they some of those guys they're really cool and i've seen kate and teen and, and chain lately but i think amongst the style masters like kel and chain um you know they're 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 at that level that you know they're that's you know two guys at the top of their game so they don't really see it eye to eye but um, I would say this, that Kel and I studied these guys, uh, all of us did, and responded in kind. One of the things that was really interesting about that time, especially when we connected with Dondi, that we were like, especially Dondi and Doro and Kel. And, um, you know, Doro, despite some, some of his misgivings in life was such an important and, and influential style master and bomber and king. And Dondi would not have been Dondi if it wasn't for Doro or Kel. Um, and it was certain writers that wouldn't be where they would be if it wasn't for Kel because he was so voracious about style writing and productions because he was learning from these guys. And if you look at these trains, for instance, you know, the, uh, word warm uh word worm and warm um they they for instance they created w names and the response out of brooklyn out of east new york was welch wink worm and if you look at that whole car that was phenomenal fully decorated with scenery top to bottom fully painted train so when they did two names like too bad um uh what do you call it um dondi uh dondi would write too many right um and so then you see tbs on top tmt too much teen and word and that word is phenomenal by chain um and then below you see kel and crash right so it's kind of like this sequential changing of the guard right in a very short period of time we're talking 77 78 79 right and that's really important because you start seeing the evolution and the development of style in a very different way and, and the type of painting um, and the evolution of this, this, this style writing movement. And so for me, uh, again, I'm the... Then we, we connect with the rock stars, Rock on City, uh, Van 2, Rest in Peace, Shy 147, Rest in Peace, Cos 207, um, A's, and those guys from uh, up, up in the Bronx, up like by Elder Avenue and Zariga. And they were doing beautiful productions, just as good as Dondi and the rest of these guys. So we gravitated towards them um, after, you know, we, between CIA and, 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 and Rock. So if you look at these whole cars uh, that you're looking at now, you see this is Kel specifically. And Kel wrote a lot of different names. He became a good style master because like part and like TDS and like TMT, he he chose different names. Different. He had one, you know, he was Delt 179 and he was Kel 139. But more importantly, 
he was taking um, that influence uh, from all these other writers uh, about let, you know, changing different styles and style letterings. And he would also do something uh, similar uh, to what Nock was doing as a, as a great style master who was giving a lot of the great style masters outlines. And Kel would give all, like once he got good, he would, he would give out outlines. He was also receiving outlines from, from Dondi. And so um, this, is, this is this environment I was under with, with, uh, with my brother and also kind of, which kind of allowed me to be, again, the little kid in the room, and which was also very contentious, you know, because him and I, uh, uh, Crash could attest to this, we would, we would fight like rivals. Um, like physical fights, because he was trying to protect me from like the the scene, so to speak. Uh, but I went out on my own, and and you could see some of my pieces here with band two. I did a top to bottom, and that was a very consequential piece, which I'll tell you in a minute. The the piece on the right upper right top that says rig rig three forty was uh, I did that with cause two hundred seven in the one tunnel, and then below. Um, you see me painting with writers that are more my age, right? Scene TC5 and Dose TC5, who I was in art and design with. Now the mare band top to bottom was important because I did that in the ghost yard. And at that, that day, that very, there are a couple things that were really important there. Um, Lady Pink was with us, Mitch 77 was with us, Scene was with us, PJ was with us, his girlfriend Linda was with us, Lady Hart was with us. And um, Mitch and Scene did that very famous whole car that everybody loves, the wild style with the crumbling, um, crumbling wall, so to speak. Um, and it was magnificent. It was amazing. And, and they, they killed it. The Mitch was beautiful. It was a, a crash outline that was amazing. And uh, Ben and I did the, the, the top to bottom with the Mickey Mouse giving the, the middle finger. Now, the PJ and Linda did a whole car and he had tagged up, they tagged up everybody but me. And I had asked her if I could, you know, tag the car and I did. And I guess that that's something that kicked off something with, with, with PJ. I mean, we were really cool, we, no, no issues. And that started a whole spiral in, in the culture and amongst rivalries and crews with UA and MPC and stuff. Um, and, and that was really unfortunate because that really changed the game and it was really like uh, dangerous for us, uh, really hostile and, 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 and violent at times. And so, you know, the, the, the truth about the culture is, it's like it, it, there's a degree of, of danger, not just legally, uh, you know, it's amongst ourselves and the rivalries. And, and the other thing that shifted for us especially with Kel, was that as a writer, he kept moving from crew to crews. And, and or, or, uh, or, or our crew would uh, swallow other crews and, you know, like uh, team up with other crews, you know, like Rock and CIA and TKA, uh, Magic. And then also we would also, also come to kind of connect with uh, uh, RTW, not the original RTW, uh, the new version of RTW, which Bill Rock, uh, you know, was kind of transferring over with Min and 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 the rest of the guys. This is post uh, uh, after Revolt and and Hayes and all these other guys, and then TBS. Then you know, uh, T Kid who was on with us recently and and did the mural for us in the museum. He started the Vamp Squad, and the Vamp Squad, you know, as he put it, was just you know they said something about you know vicking somebody and vamping, and then it became a crew. And, but then it just kind of became almost a graffiti gang. Um, and, uh, but out of, out of the necessity of protecting our productions, because what was happening was, imagine all these big productions and people just going over them, right? And so that became a very hostile and people were afraid of us, they, they were. Um, and so that was a real shifting of the time. Now here, what we're seeing is really important to me because I said to you earlier today during lunch, one of the greatest things uh, to come of this for me was as a young man to be able to paint with my childhood heroes, to actually be yes. in pro proximity to them and to learn from them. Um, the piece on top, the bus boy, 
was done in Utica. Um, uh, and that night it was me, Ramelzi, um, Gandhi, Zephyr, Slave. Um, it was a crew, a big crew of us, could you imagine, going into Utica. And so here I am painting with Zeph and two of the grandmasters are going at it. And there's another elder statesman, grandmaster, slave, just kind of hanging out, right? Not, and he's, and, and I, I do my piece with, with Zeph and, and then I do a piece with, uh, I do two whole cars with slave. And I, and I talk to him about it. He doesn't remember it. I'm like, oh my God, how could you do it? It's like such a big thing for me, but for him it's like, who's this little kid? Um, but could you imagine, you know, we did this whole production, this mayor, he did a blood piece, which I thought was dope because it was in a 70s style and the, the two O's were interlocking like 3D. It was just great. Uh, but that was really memorable. That was really quite phenomenal for me that I got to um, be with these great masters. And Nock was such a huge influence on me. I, I, there was so much about Nock that I embody in my work that was so important. And I'm glad you're showing this. Because Nock at his prime was giving everybody from rappel, even chain outlines I used to see uh, in, his, in his house. I used to see a lot of Fuzz One outlines, Band Two outlines, Fed Two outlines. So he was distributing. He actually gave out more style than, than he painted, actually. And so here, what we see that's really important here is you see a Kel piece uh, that he painted on the J line. Now, when Kel told me he was going to go painting with Nock and Dondi, I was like, oh, I got to go. I want to go. I want to go. He's like, nah, you can't go. I was wrecked. I was, I was really upset about this, right? And so next thing you know, Kel was really psyched because he, I, Kel, I think Kel thought he was going to get a hard copy outline from Nock, right? That was the prized possession to get a hard copy outline. And so he goes, he comes back, and he tells me about this. And he says, he says look, he, it's crazy. He, we went there and he had no outlines. He had no drawings. He just came off the top of his head and we did this crazy whole car and this and that. And, and then we go, I go out to Brooklyn to go watch it, to go look at it. And I'm like, oh my God, this, this is so crazy. Look at this E. And so on the right, you see uh, Porsche and E, which is a portion of a Wayne outline I did. And you see in the, not, in the Kel piece and the Kel one, uh, a Kel piece, Nock did off the top of his head, the, the O and E in a very typical straight on style, but the E is in perspective. Um, and it's one of the things that I learned from him. Um, and I think this is part of, Nock was infamous, kind of like, he's very surprising and he'll sneak up on you and, and really, I think he was very com quietly competitive. Um, and the thing for us was like, wow, you know, like the style master versus the student, the student being us and, and Don specifically. And so as I talk about Nock so affectionately, it's because I learned so much about style writing and competing with style, right? And I, there's, there's a story I like to tell about um, Nock, that's him painting with Dondi on the one line and Part and Kid did a whole car on the, on the next, next train. And Dondi at the time had a style that was really compact and low, a window down. And, and uh, Nock came in and he did a word piece with connections uh, going almost top to bottom and across. It was phenomenal. I got to tell you, that was so impactful and so amazing. And I would later use that technique against my own brother. Um, and so Nock... It, in, in, in so much of what I do in, in, in my work and even in sculpture, there is something about his work and his kind of mindset that, um, you know, embodies me. And just as I say with Ken Swift, there's something about him that is embodied in, in, in the way I work and the attitude and the kind of approach that I have, a technical and also a psychological approach. Uh, to be good and different and to, to rock. But Nock by when, far was always my favorite. When, when you see the work of Nock uh, with the example that you have here uh, at top with the letter O being replaced with a character. And when you look at the letter N with all these connections extending out part of the letter N turning into a star, you see all this explosion of colors that I attribute to 
uh, Fuzz One and his influence on everybody from a, a coloring and painting perspective. And then you see it again reflected in the way that the Kel piece at the bottom is, is colored in, but the style is obviously influenced by Nock. And here you have, you know, you're talking about these two giants of graffiti you're talking about, or you're talking about Nock. I'm adding in the, to the conversation Fuzz One. Oh, of course. He and, also and, influenced us big time. And then th there's these two Bronx artists that had so much influence, whether it was within the, you know, the designing of letters or of the coloring and how you fill in those letters or the backgrounds. Totally phenomenal, totally important, you know, and to see it have such an impact till today is is quite remarkable it's the foundation we, it's the foundation it's the it's the foundation and we still see that influence today with with knock and you know thankfully he's alive and well and still creating art you know someone before you know in the comment section you know asked about fuzz they asked about some of the other influences that um and you know i think it was jose that asked about case two uh oh, and case time. two much like knock and fuzz were tremendous influence can can you share a little bit about that yeah case oh my god butch and case uh, they were like uh you, you know they were they were like butch cassidy and the sundance kid to us man they were you know they were infamous and and case lived in my neighborhood he wasn't too far and Again, he was the stuff of legends, right? He was, he was because of his, 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 I don't want to say his disability because he was able, but he was, you know, handicapped in a way. And it was, that, that alone was a phenomenon. But the other part was that Case um, really was innovative and he had a, a complete command of his, his, of style and he loved it. He loved graffiti and one of the things for me was as a young writer, again, I never thought I would get close to, to guys like that. That wasn't in the cards for me. And, and somehow Crash, because Crash was closer to him and met him and then Kel, and the next thing you know, we're hanging out with him and, uh, and, and then I eventually, you know, be friends with him and paint with him and become part of TFP, uh, which was unheard of, you know, like I, I like, I, I never could have, that was the other thing too. It was so, for me anyway, unheard of that I would connect with some of these writers and become part of their crew and, and paint with them. And Case and I would go on to paint a couple whole cars together. And one, one of the stories that I love telling is, it's probably one of the more, again, I, I talk about the phenomena of being there with part and chain, but imagine for me, and, and my brother Kazrock is on here and he'll remember this. We went to Gun Hill Road and um, it was me and Crash that did a whole car, Fade 2 t-shirt, uh, uh, Shirt King Fade, Agent. And then uh, on the next car was Butch and Case, Scene and Kel, and Shy and Kaz. And these productions were phenomenal. But what I couldn't get over was that none of us could that Butch and Case were actually painting uh, together again after so many years and with us. And so uh, that was the, the, the first time. And then him and I painted again in the one tunnels uh, a couple times. And he had a tremendous uh, uh, foresight for, for style writing, not, you know, because his, his formula was different. It wasn't this like knock where it was free flowing. It wasn't big like Slave. It was it was uh, very much a, a, in in kind of a uh, layered geometric layers and forms kind of overlapping, um, you know something called faceting, which comes from cubism, right? Where kind of the intersecting lines and stuff like that. Um, so he was so he started getting really individual by you know the eighties. You know he was he was really kind of like. You know, again, another writer like Phase Two, who was way ahead of his time. And so, for for those of you that might not be as familiar as we are 
with these artists that uh that you're mentioning this is an example of case two's work complex uh interlocking the letters are overlapping and intertwining and and perhaps this could be considered part of his computer rock style that he mentioned but he had a style or a name for just about every style and so uh when i would ask him about particular styles he he would he would name them on the spot and he would say oh that's my roller coaster style right. or whatever style he was he was that kind of figure in the movement and so again you know we are here talking to carlos mayer about his early beginnings and i don't think carlos that we've made it to 1980 yet well, one thing I want to say, you know, about Case, I'll bring you to 1980. Um, you know, the a couple of things that are really important to all you guys who do graffiti, especially 3D graffiti. Um, you know, we had seen 3D graffiti formulating with Flint and Pistol in the 70s. Um, you know, these 3D pieces that had no outlines and uh, and whatnot. But in in Style Wars, if you look carefully at Case drawing. You know, he was alluding to the kind of modern 3D style that, that we're, we're seeing now. And it's as a style that Ernie really kind of finessed and then the Europeans caught on uh, and so on and so forth. And it's also uh, kind of a concept that was influencing me as a sculptor as well. So Case, uh, again, when you say he had many styles, he was a man of many styles and many verbal <laughs> styles. He was nice with, the, with his, his verbals. Yes, and, and, you know, he ended up influencing yourself. You know, I, I think of this piece and of these styles as a direct sort of sure. connection to that. Yeah, this is great because this is that night that I was telling you about with, with painting with Case and Butch. Uh, so Crash and I did this whole car. Uh, Crash uh, drew my outline, helped me with my outline. And, you know, the irony of all of this, right, is that, uh, what was it like last year, uh, MoMA acquired uh, the, the outline and, uh, and I was really quite shocked. And, and that's an important piece for me because of this, the backstory to it, right? Um, so to, to, to have one of my works at the Museum of Modern Art was kind of like, especially a graffiti work, I thought they'd pick up something on my, my sculptures and my modern sculptures. But that said, um, that 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 story now is in the archive of art history in a very profound way um and uh you know but more importantly in our story right where it makes sense and we say these names and we recognize these people for their styles we understand it much more right this is why we do these talks um and so uh this this one and the next one with case the the b mayor Wright was also one of those uh, pieces that was, that the drawing was acquired by the Museum of Modern Art as well. So again, another story tagging uh, another really, really important uh, um, uh, writer. You know, I don't even, I, I don't even consider myself nowhere near that level, you know, that, but, but case two is one of the great, great grandmasters. And so that story, uh, that piece, and that drawing, again, it is um, embedded into the conversation of modern art. And, and we're very happy to hear that and very thankful that they finally woke up and are embracing not only you and this movement, and it'll be in their archives and, and in, in their history. And I think that you should be recognized. Case two should absolutely be recognized. Futura should be recognized. All these artists from this generation, your brother, Kel 139, Dandi, they should all be part of museum collections around the world because the contribution is so significant, not only to that moment in time, but to art history forward until today oh, and completely. to popular culture as well. It, it, it reverberates. I mean, you have so many artists here who, like, like Jose Parla, who had an intimate relationship with Case. He was deeply influenced with, by him, and he's a con big time contemporary painter. And so, yes, you know, these people should be recognized by those 
institutions, but you know what, hell, we created our own institution to recognize them. So that's just, that's even more important, right? That we, at least we can contextualize it and, and analyze it, right? And analyze it not just in the context of a, a socio-political uh, conversation as to what the world was like, but as to how style evolved and kind of what links people together um, in the development of an art aesthetic, right? And so that, that's really important that we can have these kinds of, this is why I wanted to have this conversation about this journey through style, right? From the 70s till now. So, so here we are, 1980, Mayor 139, you're, you're sharing the influences, these sort of magic moments that are now in history. And we're seeing a, a leap forward to the finally an acceptance by some cultural institutions that sort of give us a little bit of a nod of acceptance uh, yeah. and maybe some validity or validation rather to to the work but you know it took MoMA you know 40 years to know what we knew in 1980 yeah. of our own worth of the value of these pieces by you and case two and everybody else and so it takes it takes the the art institutions and society in general sometimes a very long time to, to catch up. Right, but that's, and, again, one of the things that's really important about um, graph, so to speak, right, is that it created space for itself because it wasn't given space, right? Children weren't given space to be, you know, fully developed creatively and, and, and so socially, right? And so as we think about this transition into galleries and museums, um, Look, there was a lot of homegrown, you know, galleries, uh, you know, Noga was a great example, you know, these Noga, soul artists, uh, artists themselves creating their collectives and their, sp their safe spaces, let's just say. And I happened to, you know, I grew up in that, right? I got to see, uh, no uh, go to Noga and see the early paintings by Pace and Scorpio and others uh, on canvas. And so for me, early on, it was kind of a curiosity as to what could happen next for us. And, and one of the things that's really wonderful is that here we have um, the original Noga, was, which was in, in, uh, on the west side. Um, and then, you know, there was the other Noga that I went to up in the upper Bronx, which was in a church. And so it was really interesting for me because in those times, I never even heard of understood about painting on canvas that wasn't uh, that was unheard of like a brush that was unheard of but somebody an outsider said look you know these kids are in trouble let's give them a safe space and let's give them materials and see what they come up with and i tell you i still remember you know a vision of, of being in noga and they're having all these small canvases nice size canvas and, and i'm wishing that i could steal a few of them, you know, because they were so good. Uh, and we're talking about writers from the, the, the 70s, right? We're talking about 73 to 78 or something like that, right? So in, in this image here that you see uh, of the Noga storefront and of inside uh, of Noga, in that photo, we can't make it out, but I see Butch, Butch Pace. two. I see Knock. I see oh. Chain. I see Don One. I think Stan One Fifty Three might right. be in there. That, that that the one on the right with those guys. That's probably Uptown. Right. That's what I'm saying. That in yeah. that image, and in '77, that had a major impact on your life. And then, kind of moving forward, um, into this notion of graffiti on canvas, you have Fashion Moda. Yeah. That was in my neighborhood, yeah. Yeah, and Crash curated the show there, the gas show. And we all painted on, uh, on, on uh, like four by eight plywood. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was a great show. I, I, I did a whack piece, so they hung it in the back. So I, get, you know, I got no props for it. You know, no one, you know, no, sadly, no one uh, 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 took pictures of it or even gave me credit for it. But, yeah, I was part of this moment where 
all of a sudden, oh my God, you know, we, Stefan Eines opens up a space and, and there is this graffiti art show. Um, and that really was really important for us because now there was a venue right an alternative art venue that and it wasn't just graph because they you had all these art other artists downtown artists that would come up um well i see there the list on the left you, you see john fechner yeah uh etc and and actually something a, a a fun fact the lady pink piece that is hanging out at the museum today that's on that's right. view is from this gas show and it is her very first work on a canvas or as you mentioned on wood and so we have a piece from this show in the museum just to sort of bring it full circle to and what we're had, working on today you had, you had great artists that came out of you know a one spent a lot of time there he really developed himself out of there I mean, he rest in peace you know toxic core uh, a lot of those guys from the projects across from me the mitchell projects would be up there, crash, days, everybody would, would participate. And here you see in this photograph, outside of Fashion Moda, myself, Pink, uh, Python, Kel, and Lolly, Crash, and Lady Heart. Um, and again, it, this was so, so important for us because all of a sudden, we started thinking of ourselves a bit differently uh, about um, uh, we were young art students, everybody there, well, me, Lady Pink, Hart, Linda, everybody except Lolly and Kel and Crash went to art and design. And right, so you were in high school. Yeah, by this point, we were in, in, in high school. And you're so, in high school doing exhibitions at an alternative art space dedicated to graffiti in the Bronx. Right. And how, how did that feel? Let, let me interject for a second, because the first real exhibition of my work and some of ours was via Henry Chalfant because he showed his photographs at OK Harris Gallery. And um, that was in Soho. And that was actually a really important moment for me because um, one, we were in Soho in an art district that I would ne I'd never been to. And somebody like me as a young kid, even before all of this, you know, like I was between layups and museums. Uh, and so I was already kind of like informing myself of the greater art of the world, so to speak. But that the, the, the show in Soho, um, really not too long after, you know, uh, we started going uptown. And here you have three or four of my museums that I used to literally spent a lot of my time. Uh, the Museum of Natural History was actually across from my school. So I used to skip school and run around there. And, you know, and part of this was actually having fun and cutting class, but also learning about humanity. And, and, and but also in the Met and the modern and all that, I was taken by um, where was graffiti in all of this, right? Where are, where did we, where are we in the arc, right? And the, the, where we were, we were hidden it, I felt in uh, early 19th century modernism. And so that was my attraction. I, that's where, where, why I kept going back because I started seeing us in a different period, people, young artists in a different time. And in 1980, Henry took me to the uh, Picasso show and that changed everything for me. And this was that period, that time too, because the photo that you're showing was from uh, Sam Essie's studio because uh, Zephyr had met Ze uh, Sam Essies and they organized this studio like on 77th on the east side. And some of the top writers were going there, the Case and Dondi and Zephyr and Kaz and Shy. So all of a sudden now we're painting canvases, right? And you have some of the most elite guys in this one room. You had Mackie, you had Zephyr. Um, and, and so this was so phenomenal. This was such a, uh, 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 and, and, and if anybody has these, these photos I borrowed from Zephyr's website, he did a wonderful write-up about this, this time. And it was really unique because writers would go, they would go paint on canvas and then at night go paint trains. And here you see some of the early examples of those paintings, the knock, the shy in the middle, um, and uh, Ali, and Bill Rock, and Don, and uh, so, you know, that was a really, really amazing time for us. And, uh, and again, it was such a, I, I'll share this with you because I always thought this was so crazy. Uh, Dandi, 
uh, watching Dandi with, you know, sitting there watching him paint this, this canvas, but using whiteout, uh, that whiteout that you use for uh, correcting typing paper. Um, yeah, for his highlights. It, we, were, we were naive. We were so naive. And so me and Futura. this this is 1980. Yeah. yeah. So early, and, and, and then and I'll, I'll point out the Cheech Wizard. You know, that it was another thing. The Cheech Wizard was a big thing for all of us. We loved Von Baudet's characters. Right, and so in '81, you know, what what you're seeing here, this this newspaper clipping from the Daily News, uh, you see it says graffiti. These letters that Futura drew out. Is the art world ready for it? And there's a bunch of us uh, in soul artists. Uh, and this was kind of the second generation or so of soul artists because they were, again, these guys were older, older guys. And Ali, um, who was really an astute guy, you know, and, and, and really was, and I hope Eric Hayes today publishes some of his manifesto because his manifesto was really forward thinking to everything what we're doing now in terms of organization, a business, profession, museums, and galleries. Uh, he was already outlining that back in the 70s. And so his collective, the collective of soul artists, up, uh, when they went uptown, uh, they got a small space and they started hiring us to do signs and, and locals for the, doing work for the locals. Uh, but the question was back then, was the art world ready for it? Uh, because there was, you know, something starting to bubble downtown um, and had a lot to do with Henry bringing, uh, bringing the Rocksteady crew down um, and bringing the, the writers to the studio. And so once they, you know, the, what was so important about correlating um, hip hop and breaking to graph was because some of these guys were writers too. Um, but the Henry saw a, a kind of in a, in a, in a very... Um, good Samaritan way. I, I don't know. There was something about Henry that he saw. What he saw in us, what we couldn't see in ourselves, so to speak. Right? He 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 could. He kind of helped us kind of um, see ourselves much more than 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 what people thought we were. And so he organized some of the first exhibitions and and showcases for the B Boys downtown. Um, and then they also organized the Lincoln Center event, which was a big deal for us because the Rock so, Steady. So hang on, hang on one second, Carlos. Yeah. This image here is is a image perhaps not seen by many. And so can you share with us who yes. is in the photo, please? Um, uh, top left, you see Crazy Legs. Next to him, Mr. Freeze. You see myself. Uh, next to me, you see Rashawn Kippy D. May he rest in peace. Uh, you see Dino on the bottom, rest in peace. I see Freeze, rest in peace. And you see Ken Swift. Now, there's something really important about this. This was taken at uh, Antonio Lopez's studio. Antonio Lopez was a premier fashion illustrator um, who decided to bridge high fashion, we're talking Armani, Versace, and all of this before anyone was even like thinking about it, and the urban culture. And so uh, what he did was they, they, they photographed us and he would draw, he would put us in like really expensive Italian clothes and illustrate us. And, um, and uh, he, had, he had actually had a book opening uh, uh, launched at Studio 54 where he hired a1, Bill Blast, me, uh, I forget who else, to paint inside Studio 54. So this is this kind of like convergence, right, of uptown and downtown, but also you're seeing like this kind of crossover into high fashion um, at the highest level at that time. But also you had going a little further down below 14th Street, you had everything going on downtown. You had the Shafrazi Gallery, the Fun Gallery, uh, 51X. You know, you had this other energy, right, happening. At, at all, if you thought about it, all the way from uptown to downtown in the period, something was always popping, something exciting uh, all the way through, you know, from music, art, and dance. So for, for those of you that don't know, I, I do highly recommend to look up Antonio Lopez and his work. It's phenomenal. The Puerto Rican artist. 
phenomenal. And and rest in peace yeah. to him as well. Yeah. And so you, you, here you are with Rock Steady. You mentioned Henry and and Futura called out saying he was benevolent. Look at that. Yeah. And here you have Frosty. Rest in peace. So so now okay. imagine the ghetto comes to this place, this sacred ground, right, Lincoln Center. This is where you go see Balanchine. This is where you go listen to Mozart. You know. And here you are, these kids, rivals, battling each other. And, and, and all these kids, all these people came down to see Dynamic and, and Rocksteady break. It was an exciting time. It was wild. And, I, and again, it, it was something that we had no idea what the future implications would hold. Um, and of course, here we are in the future talking about it. Phenom phenomenal time to be alive. You know, post this, all these films started to come out yeah. to celebrate this culture and to celebrate yeah. some of these players. Here you have the Wild Style poster. Yeah. You have, you know, of course, Style Wars uh, and, and your scene uh, there. You have Martha capturing the behind the scenes yeah. uh, of these films and, and these cultural moments. Um, and you guys were, many of you were still in high school. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. And, and, and then and for those they of you were that don't know. Yeah, no, they were documenting us. They, uh, we became friends. I mean, Henry and I particularly became very good friends and he was a mentor. And then again, you said we were in high school. This school doesn't exist anymore, but this was the high school of art and design. And if, you know, some of those that have uh, listened to some of the previous talks I did, you know, there were a lot of writers who went to art and design before us that were phenomenal. A lot of the great writers. And I happened to be there at a time where there was this next generation. Um, and it's interesting because I came to the school already primed, so to speak, because um, by the time I connected with Rocksteady and those guys, I was already at a certain level in a certain, in a certain way uptown in the Bronx. So when I got to art and design, all of a sudden I'm meeting uh, all these, of course, those who I knew from the neighborhood, um, uh, Days was at Art and Design. Um, you had uh, Popmaster Fable, Wiggles. Um, so there was this whole enclave of people, Lady Pink. Here you see me with Mixer, who was one of my writing partners. He was also from the Bronx, Mixer. No, people don't know him much. Uh, but you see that infamous picture that M Marty took with me and Lady Pink in the bathroom. So now imagine going to a high school I always tell folks, if you've ever seen that movie Fame, uh, imagine that with three X's, triple X rated, because in this school, everything went. The sex, drugs, rock and roll, the violence. And it was a hub for, for other writers to come mm -hmm. and other people to come you know, to, to our school. And here you see the bathroom. You see how derelict it is. It's, everybody was writing. We used to smoke in the bathroom, cigarettes and weed. Uh, it was crazy. It was a crazy time where young kids were like taking LSD and quaaludes and being creative and you had photography. I happen to be, it's an interesting time because I, I'll say this about art and design. I went to art and design and I, start, I, I had the intention of uh, becoming a fashion designer and I was learning how to drape and cut patterns and this would be formative for me because that's what would eventually translate to what I would do in sculpture, because in class, um, I was draping arrows and doing, thinking of like really high-end stuff. There were other, there were designers that I loved that were dressing women beautifully. And I wanted to dress my girlfriend beautifully at the time, Lisa Leone. And, and, I, and I, in fact, my first love was photography, which she went into, but then because she went there, I said, fuck it, I love fashion. Let me see what it's like. But it wasn't my kind of industry. You know, I, I was a young straight man. I just couldn't fit into that. But I loved, I loved the craft. And, uh, but I, I saw it as everything else after that through the lens of graffiti style writing. And that was really important for me. And here you see we had a gallery in, in the school. And so this was a show. You see Mixer, Foam, Scene, TC5 next to Lady Pink and Midge. Uh, Ernie next to me, and I'm standing on his shoulders with a can on his head. I don't know some of these other guys. 
but it was an interesting school because it, it you know there was this one we had a writer's corner there a, a, a table where everybody used to go and bring their books and and sign books trade books fights make plans um and it was a really dynamic school and a lot of great people uh came out of there and so carlos we've made it to maybe 1981 <laughs> in two hours you've got so many stories to tell i'm sorry yeah it's a lot no it's i think it's wonderful i think it's a wonderful way to sort of take a trip down memory lane with you yeah. and and learn some of this history that for you is very personal but for us who are uh outsiders and yeah. you know we we get to just learn really and learn the connections learn about um, who's who and what's what and, and, and sort of these intimate connections. Um, and we appreciate that very much. We appreciate you spending so much time with us on your birthday. Um, and we're approaching the two hour mark. Yeah. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to wrap it up yeah. and say, uh, no more hours. We're going to go and meet up after this and, and, yes. and get together in, in the physical, yes. um, but I want to say thank you very much. Thank you for your continued contributions to this movement. Thank you for being an advocate uh, and a an ally uh, and for dedicating yourself uh, once again to to this movement and and the things that you do, the things that we do here in the museum uh, are very important to yourself yeah. and to me, but they're we're 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 servicing a bigger community. Um, and so this is part of your life's life's work. Yeah. Uh, happy 55. Uh, we want to see you around for another 55. <laughs> no, I don't want to be around another 55. And so uh, we're going to continue the work. Yeah. We're going to continue to celebrate you, your accomplishments, yes. uh, your peers. And we're going to move forward into 2021. Uh, and do good work. And so yeah. once again, Carlos, thank you very much. Thank you. Happy Alan. holidays to everybody. Yeah. That and has we'll, been we'll with continue us. this conversation because there's more to cover. I think we'll do another, another, another session in the future that covers that transition, right? Into, into we'll, fine art. We'll make it into 1984. Uh, next we'll time. time. This time. We'll take our time. And so, and so for everybody, it is, uh, the holidays, we, we wish you very well and, and much love to all of you, wherever you are, from all of us here in Miami. Uh, I'm Ket. You're with Mayor 139. We are part of the crew at the Museum of Graffiti. Uh, we wish you the very best, and we'll see you very soon. Happy holidays, and God bless. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for the well wishes. Peace. And take good care. Bye.